Well, hello there, and today I am privileged to have you join me as we talk to the awesome, amazing, and incredible Leslie Morrissey. Leslie, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come and talk to us and share with the audience. How are you? I'm brilliant. How are you? <laughs> Well, I'm much better now that my tech issues are settled. Thank you very much. <laughs> Leslie, I really, I love chatting with you. And I'm just warning everyone, we could go on for hours and we're not going to. <laughs> Leslie, please share a bit about who you are, how you got where you're going and what you do. Okay, not necessarily in that order, perhaps. No. <laughs> right. My name is Leslie Morrissey. I run a small marketing agency. I suppose you could call it a boutique agency. There's three of us. We all do different things. Um, so it means we can do the bits that we really enjoy doing, and we don't have to do the bits that are less exciting to us particularly. So we all complement each other, which is brilliant. And we work virtually and we've always worked virtually. So when lockdown came along, nothing changed for us other than we lost a couple of very small clients who obviously were, you know, having operational problems simply because of the, the situation. Um, but yeah, our, our clients are widely varied. People say, oh, you are you sort of do you have a niche? And the answer is not at all. We, we work with mostly small companies or entrepreneurs that are solopreneurs or um, speakers um, or trainers or just people who have a, an idea and need help to uh, do the things that again they don't like doing and it, it is very much that that way you know it's not necessarily they can't do it it's just they don't have the time or the urge but they know it needs doing. So um, how did we get here? Well, it's been a long and torturous journey. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> it's, it not it it, it's not been torturous, it's been interesting and fascinating. Um, back in, I'm quite old, so back in the 1980s, mid-1980s, I worked for Dubai Duty Free for nine years, and working for Dubai Duty Free was like being dipped in the marketing pond, because oh, wow. the, the guy who ran it was a very, very good marketer, and whether you were um, a, a purchasing manager or, or a shop floor manager or whatever, you, you got marketing you had to get marketing um i was eventually the hr manager but um and training manager prior to that and a couple of other roles but realistically i got the job with duty free to work with a general manager because i could write oh. because he knew that i wrote i pu published in the local newspapers and magazines so he wanted somebody who could write good copy. And although my job wasn't directly in marketing, I always worked with marketing because I was within the organization, the writer, if you like. So quite often we got um, things that came from the newspaper. They come and they did, they, one time they came and interviewed him and they went away and wrote a load of stuff that wasn't accurate. And after that, he said, I said, no, that's not going to happen. I want to see what you've written. Now, this is really unusual because in journalism, generally you don't get to see what the journalist has written before it goes to press. But because in Dubai, they were part, duty free was part of the government organization, it's part of the Department of Civil Aviation. So they had a lot of clout. So they put their foot down with a firm hand, as the saying goes. And, and I got to look at everything and rewrite it if necessary so it was accurate and said what we needed to say which is quite unusual but uh yeah so that was where it started and then I sort of always ran, ran these two careers alongside each other and when I came back to the UK which is where I'm based now in 1997 I set up the, the, the training and development company that I've been working for in Dubai. I sort of set up a, a version of that here with the okay of the girl who originated that. It was called Attitudes, which will be right up your street. It's definitely. <laughs> we, our, our theory was that people 
don't learn new things unless their mind is open. And in order to open their mind, they need to understand what thinking is going on. So it's a bit like, you know, you have to get the tin opener out and open the tin first before you can put anything in it. So um, that that's what our approach to management training and customer service and communication skills and all of that. So I used to do all of that training. Wow. And then, so I was doing that. Meanwhile, I was a member of the Institute of Management. So I went along to my local branch and I just happened to turn up at their AGM. I didn't realize that it was their AGM at that point, but there you go. And one of the, uh, well, the committee was sort of discussing the year ahead. And somebody said, we need to improve the newsletter because it was currently a, a set of A4 photocopy sheets. That was it. And um, I mean, it I, was a new sheet in the real term of a new it sheet. It was literally somebody typed it and printed it and photocopied it. That was it. So then there was maybe two or three pages. And, and this was a branch newsletter, not, not the main oh. organization. So I put my head above the parapet and said, I know how to do that. And they said, oh, wow, um, would you be willing to do it for us? And as I was just sort of getting my feet under the table and I hadn't really got the businesses running properly, I sort of said, yeah, okay, I'll have time to do that. So I did... Um, a newsletter for the Institute of Management branch. And it was an A5, I don't know, about 16 page newsletter, properly produced, laid out and um, printed by a local printer. And they really liked that. Anyway, I got a phone call from the guy who was at that time chairman of the committee and said, I work for Ford Motor Company. Would you like to come and talk to me about newsletters? Because we need to do an in-house one. And as a result, this was the end of 1999, I started working with them to do an in-house newsletter every six weeks. And so we would, I was doing about a day a week on site, finding out what was going on. It was very much what the company was doing, not what individual people were doing. Um, and it, it sort of took off from there, but I didn't want to dilute the Attitudes brand into something that was nothing to do with training and development. Mm -hmm. So I started Inside News and it's called Inside News because it was internal newsletters. And I did that for three years. So I ran these two companies alongside each other. And um, I ended up in 2005, Attitudes had then got three directors and five staff. But it, it wasn't, yeah, it sounds like, oh, wow. But actually, it wasn't successful because all the directors had different backgrounds. Um, so I was from consumer side of things. Elaine was from um, banking, but training. And Tony was from further education with a management accounting background, which was weird because he was rubbish at keeping track of the numbers. <laughs> And, and we all were pulling in slightly different directions and it meant that we never settled and got this, this is what we're trying to do. These are the people we're trying to reach, let's go get them. It was very much of, well, we could help these people with that and these people with this and those people with, and we were all over the place. Mm -hmm. So the company didn't, it made just about enough to break even but it didn't make enough to pay us a decent salary. And in 2005, I, I thought I can't keep doing this because I was living on credit card money and I'm thinking I don't want to be there. So I resigned <laughs> and, mm. and, um, and I went back to the inside news because uh, that had been just sort of bubbling along, not doing very mm. much and so on while we were sort of doing all this other stuff. And um, I went networking. Basically, I was um, I'd already joined e Academy, which was a British based networking organization started in 1998. And um, I really worked hard at online networking. It was a sort of it was a bit like LinkedIn, but friendlier at that time, because LinkedIn at the time was existed but it was very sterile. It was uh, a dating agency for employers and employees, basically. That's, well, that's, that's a wonderful description. Yes. 
so um yeah that that sort of how all, all that came together and then I ended up at uh, that year I ended up working with the academy so I ran their customer support and best practice teams they didn't have a team they had one lady who did it and she wanted to step down and I applied and met uh, Penny Power who was the the uh, one of the owners her and her husband owned it and um, she asked me she said I've got a very young lad who's really keen but I don't think he's got the knowledge to be able to do it so I trained him then I got a couple of other people and um, I ended up with um, about four or five people on a team and I ran the team for them so that so I got to know the background of social media really well mm-hmm. so yeah it was all all good <laughs> that is so awesome I just you know what as you were talking really struck me is how you allowed things to unfold. Mm. It's not like you forced anything. You just went with the flow. Is that an accurate summation of it? And uh, Yeah, what- I mean, yes, because, I, I mean, obviously, Inside News has evolved because, mm. you know, we don't do internal newsletters anymore because when we we stopped doing Fords, but we did we done a couple of others but people don't do that kind of thing any longer mm-hmm. I mean in those days it was a hard copy we used to print sort of eight thousand of these mm-hmm. it was sort of five five and a half thousand people on the site but a lot of them didn't have work, uh, computers because they were in the, the fleet workshop mm-hmm. so they needed a hard copy also it was really useful for them to at least to send it out to like the institute of engineers and people like that other people that were interested because mm-hmm. the, the the location for Ford was their research and design center so there was a lot of interesting stuff going on there but we had to be very careful about what was published mm-hmm. that we weren't putting out anything that was still under wraps with new designs and things like that so yeah it was, it was interesting we used to be on site about a day a week wandering around sort of asking questions and translating engineers explanation of what that was into a language that other engineers who weren't in that field could understand let alone the layman because it's quite interesting that that the you know somebody who built clutches didn't understand the chassis or not didn't understand it but didn't understand the technology behind it because Mm. they were in two different disciplines Mm. so we had to be able to create something that was um, that spoke a language everybody could understand without needing a degree, you know. Yeah, it's a bit like trying to get cats in one place, I would say. <laughs> Somebody the other day said to me, they asked me to do something, I said to me, and by the way, it's like herding cats. And I looked at them and I said, okay, we can do this. That is fascinating. So did you ask for help with the terminology? Did you just sit down and figure it out? How did no, you I asked them to talk to the engineer and ask stupid questions until I understood it, basically. Wow. Well, what they would they would consider to be stupid questions. <laughs> but, um, you know, they, they, so they come up with some technology term and I go, so what is that? And they go, blah, blah, blah. And I go no, no, what do, how, how would you explain it to an idiot? Because at the moment, I, I don't have any engineering qualifications and some of the people reading this won't so you need to explain it to me in words one syllable and they were great most of them were really good and they would do that that is very powerful I remember when we first met you were taking somebody's book this is way off what we're discussing now you were taking somebody's handwritten book Mm -hmm. and rewriting it how often does that happen for you that's a sort of almost a separate bit of the business and that's something I do because I love it um back in 2006 I had a and and this is a, this is one of these woo-woo experiences <laughs> um, <laughs> I belonged to the professional speaking association and I think you have something similar in South Africa mm-hmm. um but my the, the one over here was based on the American version which I think was where they all sort of stemmed off for from mm-hmm. but I'd gone up to Peterborough which is about an hour and a half drive from here um to attend a meeting a monthly meet a monthly I think it was monthly they used to have their meeting and they'd asked me if I would speak about website stuff because I knew a bit about that and I'm I'm sort of 
standing in the corridor outside the room with the other people because somebody married managed to lock the door and we couldn't actually go into the meeting oh, no. room. and there was only a small group of us and I was talking to somebody and the lady next to me said did I hear you mention Dubai and I said yeah I used to live there she said oh so did I, I went oh really when were you there? So she named an eight year period. And I went, well, that's when I was there. What's your name? She said, oh, my name's Joe Parfit. And I said, I know who you are. So she said, what's your name? I said, Leslie Morrissey. She went, no, it doesn't ring any bells. I went, oh, you would have known me as Leslie Kane. Oh, yes, I know who you are as well. Yeah. So, so then, then we had this conversation. we would both written for the same magazines, but we'd never met in eight years. It was oh, really wow. bizarre. Because Dubai is quite, the expat community is quite mm -hmm. tightly knit. So you, especially when you're writing the same magazine, you would expect mm -hmm. us to have met. And we just never did. Mm -hmm. And she did a lot of um, books. And so we got talking and we ended up friends. So we, she taught me a lot about editing books. And I took to it like a duck to water. And she was great. So... She gave me some of her books, that she, her clients' books to edit, and then I got some others of my own, and I sort of did that alongside doing the web copywriting and all that kind of thing. And uh, and now I do, I, I said, I, I always say I aim to do two a year because it's quite time-consuming. Mm. And I've done three in the last year, and I've got two oh. more coming. So, oh. well, three if you count, one was... One was published um, November, last, uh -huh. no, 1st of December, I think it was last year. Mm -hmm. um, one was, I did earlier this year, was published on the 17th of November, just gone. And the, the, the handwritten one, which the author's 92, so he doesn't have any technology in his house, not Wi-Fi, not a smartphone, nothing. So I literally had to read, and, and he writes extremely well. But we're now at the point where the book is now finished. It's 55,000 mm -hmm. words. It's his life story, but it's really interesting. That's not a lot. Of, it's about normal for a book, 50,000 mm -hmm. words. And um, his children now have to read it and basically say, yeah. But they're, they're, they're a little bit, oh, we're not sure we want to do this, you know. So I'm just waiting to see what happens. I'm in touch with his daughter. So we'll see what happens as a result of that. And then I've got um, another lady who's been referred to me who wants to write her life story as a novel based on real yeah. events. So that's going to be interesting. And she doesn't want to write. She just wants to talk it out to me. Mm. And... Um, and another lady who has a course that she wants to convert into a, a book to help people with what it is she teaches. So I suspect I'll be getting the course and taking the content of the modules and videos and things and turning them into chapters. So that'll be interesting too. Interesting and quite time consuming. How do you manage your days? Because you've got so many different <laughs> things working with. It's like I'm going squeak here. Um, yeah, I, I do a to-do list. I have one of these. It's a yes. oh, this, I love it. this is this is an index, a little index card. And my theory is if it doesn't fit on the card, it isn't going to get done. That is a very good theory. For those of you on the podcast, it's really quite small with a, a paper clip holding it, not paper clip, yeah. a, a bulldog clip holding it together, yeah, yeah. a mini bulldog clip. I it's, love that philosophy. It's a little tiny, it's about a three by five index card. It's mm -hmm. small. But, but also um, I do put things into my diary because if I don't have it in the diary I tend to forget so I block so it's not just appointments but like if I have work to do like writing blogs for clients they're they're already scheduled every month into the diary mm -hmm. so I know when I've got to put them together and even for our own business because I write four or five blog, well one a week basically for our mm -hmm. for inside news so mm -hmm. I do those in a batch at the beginning mm -hmm. of the month and then Heather, who's one of my team, takes the 
them and finds an image and turns them into social media posts and into a newsletter and uploads the blog. And so she does all of that because I'm good at creating systems, but she's very good at delivering on them. And that's her role in the team. And the other lady who works with me, Elle, she's a PR person. She's very good at content for social media. So she'll create content for Instagram and for Facebook and all those kind of things. So, so we all do our bit. <laughs> I love that because teamwork can often be obstructive. And yet from what I've heard from you yours flows because each of you works in your zone of genius and your zone of um greatness um and then the rest gets put it given to the other one that sounds amazing mindset plays a very large part in what you've discussed here how do you feel your mindset has shifted and changed through working with other people's words in inverted commas Ooh, i i hmm. I don't know that when I started working with Attitudes, the training company in 94, the thing that we worked on was the whole, how your brain does what it does. So it, it was very much a case of um, thinking about beliefs, self-taught, the, the power of belief, because most people tell themselves they can't do things rather than that they can. And we, we tend, because the way, the language is there's an awful lot of negative things that go on so the th just silly little things you don't think about it but if if somebody's saying that I'm never sick the, mm -hmm. the strong word in that sentence is sick not not never it's mm -hmm. sick so sick is always in the frame there but people don't say I'm always healthy yes it's really bizarre the way our language is got that way so I taught myself positive attitude um, with the help of all the programs that we then delivered um, and, and I do believe that you get what you expect you know and if you start mm -hmm. expecting doom and gloom don't be surprised if that's what happens <laughs> so when it comes to words my job is to you know people do this what is your life purpose and I did a I've been on lots of courses and things to do with all of that. And one of them sat us down with a piece of paper and said, just write down your life purpose and gave us about 40 minutes to do this. And it just came to me. My life purpose is translating other people's messages. Beautiful. And wow. so that's where my skill set sits is I translate your message in your words in a way that other people can digest it. And uh, I think because I've been told many times that I capture people's voices and I don't know how I do that. Well, I sort of half know. I think it's just because I listen to what people say mm -hmm. and then I write down what they've said. And you know, I, I get people who say, did I say that? Yes, she did. <laughs> and one of my friends, I wrote her website and she frequently used to get people come and say, gosh, that must have taken you forever to write that. And she went, I didn't write any of it. Leslie wrote it. They say, it sounds like you talking. That's the secret. It's, it's you deeply intuitive, Leslie, and you tap into the person's soul. And that's what makes a phenomenal translator of other people's messages mm. I think that's beautiful thank you so much for touching on that about I'm never sick people forget that when you look at what you wish to not have you very often bring it into your life because where focus goes energy flows mm. and that is something I've really been speaking about on the podcast is speak up what you would like to have I would like wellness. I choose to have wealth. I choose to have health. I choose whatever it is. I am having it. Mm -hmm. How have you seen language shift in the last 20 years? I think it's partly an age thing as well. I think younger people today are much more likely to say what they want. Mm -hmm and are less likely to have parents that smack them down and say, no, you, you know, know your place. <laughs> you know? Whereas I think the older generation, because if, if you were growing up 
in the 60s and 70s, there was an element of, it was going in the right direction, but it was still, you know, don't, don't get, you know, aspirations beyond your status, you know, yeah. whereas now that's not, not a thing. So people's expectations and, you know, you hear older people saying, oh, I don't know these young people, they're coming along and they, they want to be an influencer, whatever that is, you know, and, and they think they can make money on YouTube. Well, actually they can. And they if, do. Yeah, and they do if they know what they're doing, but not everybody yeah. does. So yeah. it's a myth that it's, you know, an accident. I mean, people, it's like any other thing that you do, you just keep doing it until you get good at it. And that's that's how it's sort of, and yeah, sometimes you get a lucky break, but that happens in every business and every, every sort of part of, of life. Oh, but, I've, I've, if you heard what Gary Player said, the more I practice, the more I perfect my skill, the luckier I become. Yes. And I've seen that. What you're describing to me is you set the intention and you draw towards yourself. What is your next level of purpose yeah. expansion? So I love the way you've put that. Yes. And mm -hmm. while you were talking, I was just thinking a lot of our parents came out of the depression after the second mm -hmm. world war. And that definitely had an influence on life. It really did. What, what are you really passionate about in your work? Oh, simplicity, I think. Because I think you don't need a thousand words to put over a straightforward message. I think the fewer words you can use, the better. I was taught, and I can't remember who told me this, but it's a long time ago, um, one idea per paragraph and one thought per sentence oh, and I found that a really really useful thing mm. to keep in the back of my mind when I'm talking to people and about what they want to say and you get some people who are really wordy I'm working with a lady at the moment who has switched from being a VA to being a writer and research researchers for blogs and things. And she she writes good English, but she writes quite long. Um, so, well, it's not necessarily convoluted, it's necessarily flowery in places. Yes. So she, I've told her this and I said, you know, this is what my father was told when he was a kid at school, writing long, long essays and his teacher told him, you must learn to murder your children. And I believe George Bernard Shaw said that originally, okay. but, but it's been in the back of my mind because I used to do exactly that. I used to write these amazing descriptive pieces when I was a kid, you know, and, and, and dad would look at it and go, What's this, what's this about? And I get, well, it's a description. It's a hillside and a river and some nice folk, you know. And he, he, said, he said, but why have you written it? And I hadn't got an answer. You know, it was because I can. And he said, no, there, has, there has to be a point. You know, what? there has to be a point to people reading this. Otherwise, it's just words. It's just yeah. any words would do, you know. Yeah. And, and that I took to heart. So I think a few words that get the message over is that's what I've honed my talent to if you like over the years is to say something as clearly and simply as possible mm -hmm. however I am the apostrophe police as well I do get on my my sort of oh. hobby horse about punctuation and spelling yes. and grammar and stuff it's the weirdest thing I'll look at a thing I oh my goodness I'm not so good with grammar but I'll look at something and I'll pick up all the spelling mistakes and like this doesn't make sense. How can we rephrase this sentence? Well, my husband's one who will put 15 thoughts in one sentence and you just read and read and read and read. And uh, he's learned as well. If he would like me to read it, he puts it in yeah. some sentences. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, it's, it's really weird because I think it's one of those things you have an aptitude for. So I, I can take a long piece and turn it into something that's much more focused mm. but I don't know really how I do it it's just something I've always been able to do so it's a gift it's I just guess. grateful for your gift it's a yeah. really awesome <laughs> gift. I'm grateful for it too because it's helped me on occasions yeah. so thank you but, 
Yes, and I think so because it's enabled me to do what I love. Yes. And people think, oh, you know, you do all this stuff, it takes you all day. No, it doesn't. I'm fairly organised. I don't work from, you know, dawn till till midnight mm-hmm. or anything. I, I work the hours I want to work. Sometimes when there's a big project going on, then I'll pull all the stops out and get up early and do, uh, you know, start early and finish late. But most of the time, I don't do that because I want to have a life as well. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what do you do for fun? I sing in a choir. And I read a lot of books. <laughs> Beautiful. Tell us about the choir. Um, it was started in January 2020 by a guy called Andy Small called Busketeers. And it's to raise funds for charities. Not any particular yeah. charity. But of course, in his first term, we got nearly to the end of term and then lockdown happened. Mm-hmm. So he went online and we've carried on learning and we're now obviously back in the room. We've got a performance tonight at our local cathedral. Oh, beautiful. With 300 of us singing with two audiences, one early and then one after. We kick one audience out and bring another audience in and we do it all again. So it's a set of about 10 songs, about a 45 minute set. And we did it last year and raised about £8,000. In total, since the choir started, we've raised somewhere around £70,000. That is wonderful. Wow. For various different charities, yeah. Something so, sim- uh, so in inverted commas, simple and so effective, I think. And it brings so much joy. I love here, listening to choirs. So Yeah. Well, we, we don't sing sort of, um, you know, choral stuff. We, we sing yeah. pop music and things that's like cool. that, you know, I'm out of love. We, we are singing Oh Holy Night because that's our Christmas song this year. Oh. But, um, and as Andy puts it, it's got smooshy me- melodies, smooshy harmonies in it. So, you know, <laughs> but, oh. but it's fun. And, and it's interesting that one of the girls in the choir has a T-shirt, which I keep meaning to go and see if I can find. And it says on the front, I don't need a therapist. I sing in a choir. <laughs> that is beautiful. I, I don't think the therapist would be so happy. And yet it does. <laughs> Because if you think about it, just like words, singing is frequency and frequency yeah. heals. It's very sad to say our time is drawing oh. to a close. What final words of wisdom would you like to share with our audience around mindset, writing, whatever comes to mind? Uh, I do think you get what you expect. I think I think you like a juice machine. And, it, you know, if you if you put grapefruits in, you don't get apple juice out. Yeah. So what you put in is what you get out. So if you go around with positive things going in and you open yourself to the opportunity for positive things, then positive stuff comes out and and vice versa, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. My children are one of each. I've got I've got a positive positive daughter and a, a Mr. Glass half empty <laughs> as, as a son. And, I like and although I had a really good joke recently, um, and it was you heard that uh, uh, you know an optimist sees the glass as half full, and a pessimist sees the glass as half empty, and an engineer sees as that the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> That is amazing. And then you have somebody who practices mindset alchemy comes and says, oh, where's the jug? So he can fill us up and have more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Leslie, it's been such a pleasure having you. People, I'm going to put Leslie's information below. So if you would like to speak to her about copywriting, social media, anything, please get hold of her. Leslie, thank you for coming forward. And, oh, it's been such a delight listening. I actually didn't remember that you'd been in Dubai. So that was lovely listening. <laughs> <laughs> and my son lives there now. <laughs> Say again? Your? My son now lives there because it was always home to him. So he went back there. Oh, that's am- Isn't life interesting how we all shift and change? We could start a whole new conversation. We're going to have to invite you back. People have a wonderful and incredible rest of the day please remember to leave a five-star rating on iTunes and Spotify, like and share, and come and find us and chat some more. Bye-bye. Bye.